Giant Dicky shorts with your socks pulled way up, Volcom and Hurley shirts, Macbeth shoes, and gelled up spiky hair. Sweatbands on your forearm for some reason that nobody seems to be able to explain. Sign me up. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and this is the second installment of my series where I look at scene fashion trends and take a deeper dive as far as where they came from, what they mean, how they got popular, and kind of what their significance is to the larger culture as a whole. Last time, I did 2000s metalcore fashion with the neon cartoon monster shirts and all that, and today we're going to look at another era that is near and dear to my heart, the 2000s pop punk era, the golden era of drive through records and TRL and Blink and New Found Glory. I'm going to get into all that, but first I want to thank Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Manscaped makes grooming products for your dick. That's right, your penis, and also for your balls. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, what does my dong have to do with pop punk? What does your dong not have to do with pop punk? For example, let's say you wanted to recreate the iconic video for What's My Age Again, where you and a couple best friends run naked down the streets of San Diego. You would want your wiener to look its best, right? Well, that is where this guy comes into play. Just use this guy to give that bush a little trim, and you are good to go. Or let's say that girl you've been crushing on and wrote a million whiny pop punk songs about decides that she likes you back. Next thing you know, you're on a date with her and it's about to go down. You don't want to ruin that moment with stinky balls, do you? That is where Manscaped's ball wipes and ball deodorant will be your best friend. Just spritz a little of this on these and you are ready for action. Or I don't know, maybe you just want to take off your pants and jacket. Why not pamper yourself first? So if you are ready to pamper your penis with Manscaped, hit that link in the description. You will get 20% off and free shipping. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. If you don't like shoes at all, you can just fuck right off. Okay, first up, the number one thing that comes to mind to me when you say 2000s pop punk fashion is the Dickies shorts. You know, the ones that are several sizes too big, halfway down to your ankles, like they're half shorts, half pants, shants. And of course, with the socks pulled up super high and all held up with a cloth web belt as seen in this picture of Blink-182. They're definitely the poster children for that look, but it wasn't just them. You saw this look on bands from all over the place, from Sum 41 up in Canada, Simple Plan also in Canada, Good Charlotte from Maryland, Mast from Chicago. It was just everywhere. Everyone was doing the Dickies chance with high socks thing, which is really interesting to me because as a lot of you guys know, the origins of this look, especially like the Travis Barker version of it, I would say he's probably the one person that popularized it more than anyone else. It has its roots in the way that Latino gangs of Southern California dress. I mean, look at these pictures of like your typical gang member compared to Travis and Blink. You got the giant dicky shorts, you got the socks pulled up super high, you got the web belt hanging down to your knees. All that stuff is like straight out of the Cholo lookbook. Fuck these other vatos, you say? So how did it make its way from the streets of like East LA to a bunch of pop punk kids in Montreal? Great question, and this is probably a good time for me to break out a chart to explain it. Because we have to have a chart, right? Some of you may have seen this before, it's called the Rogers Adoption of Innovation Curve, and it's usually used to show how technology products eventually end up getting adopted by the mass market, or don't. For example, when MP3 players first came out, you know, 20 years ago or whenever it was, they were really expensive, kind of hard to use, and so the only people that used them were the innovators. This segment here, that tiny little 2.5% of the market that was willing to put up with the cost and hassle because they wanted to play MP3s. But then they got a little bit better, a little bit cheaper, and so because of that, they were adopted by the next stage of this curve, the early adopters, roughly 13.5% of the market. But they were still a little bit clunky. What really took MP3 players to the mainstream was the iPod. That is what made MP3 players go mainstream and reach the other segments in the market here. All the way to the end of the curve here, that last 16% of the market that like just bought an iPod shuffle on clearance at Walmart like last Christmas. <laughs> And the trickiest part of this whole thing is right here, going from the early adopter segment to the early majority segment, because this is when you cross over from the niche market to the mass market. If you're interested, there's actually a great book that is specifically about this called Crossing the Chasm, because this is where most products fail. For example, the Zune, which was never able to successfully cross the chasm and really go mainstream the way that Microsoft wanted it to. It's not an iPod, so I know I'm gonna like it. So let's bring all that back to pop punk. And again, how did this cholo style go from the streets of East LA to a bunch of kids up in Canada? Pop punk, and specifically Travis Barker, because he's always been more down with street culture than really anybody else in pop punk. I think that is what took that like cholo inspired skateboarder thing from something that really was only found in Southern California to the rest of the world. 
the kind of global nature of this trend really hit me when Bullet For My Valentine started getting big. This was before social media, so you didn't necessarily know all the details about a band like you do now. And I just kind of assumed that they were from Southern California because they kind of sounded like Atreyu or 18 Visions or Bleeding Through. And in pictures, they had the Southern California look. They were wearing the big dicky shorts with socks pulled up and famous stars and strap shirts. I thought it was kind of weird that they were still dressing like that in like 2004, 2005, but I don't know. I just assumed there were some bros from Riverside that were really into Dickies. Ready for FMX games this summer? You kidding me, guy? You know how hard I grease it. And then I found out that they were from Wales, of all places, which for anybody who doesn't know is part of the UK. And then it all made sense. They were a few years behind the times because that's how long it took this trend to like percolate out, to go from Southern California all the way to Wales. And I say that not to make fun of them, like, Oh my God, you guys are still wearing that? That is so 2001. My point is that although it did make its way from Southern California all the way up to Wales, it just took longer because we didn't have social media and e-commerce the way that we do now, where now like if a kid sees a cool outfit on Instagram, he just pulls up his phone, orders it in five minutes and boom, it's on his doorstep in like three days. I'm not complaining about like, oh, kids these days, you just order everything on the internet. That's a good thing. I'm happy that people have access to stuff. I just think it's really interesting to see how much more quickly ideas spread now versus back then. And this is a great example of that. And that actually brings us to the next trend, which is kind of along the same lines. Were you even a 2000s pop punk kid without a closet full of Hurley, DC, Volcom, and Quicksilver shirts in every color of the rainbow? And with this stuff, I think it's kind of the same story as the Dickies shorts thing. As a lot of you guys probably know, these are all like surf and skate brands that have been around for decades. Like I think Quicksilver just celebrated their 50th anniversary. But until I guess probably sometime in the late 90s, if you wanted to get some of this stuff, you had to go to a core surf or skate shop. Or at the very least, you had to live near one of the like cooler chain retailers like Active or Zoom or Tilly's, which back then weren't everywhere like they are now. What's up, bang bang ski ski dude. My name is Bryson. And just like they brought that SoCal Cholo inspired look to the mainstream, I think the pop punk bands of the 2000s were also a super important part of what helped brands like Hurley and Volcom cross the chasm from like that smaller core action sports market to the mainstream. The exposure and visibility that they got from working with those brands coupled with the expansion of a bunch of big retailers back then like PacSun and Zoomies. And to get into more detail about the exposure piece, the one thing you have to consider is how much mass media coverage all this stuff was getting back then. For anybody who's younger, it's probably kind of hard to imagine that, but I would say that like Blink and Sum 41 and Newfound Glory were as mainstream as, I don't know, probably like Post Malone or something is now. That's a common misconception. Maybe not quite that big, but pretty fucking big. They were on the cover of huge magazines like Rolling Stone and Spin, and magazines, of course, mattered back then a lot more than they do now. They were on MTV all the time. Blink did like the Spring Break special, Simple Plan, New Found Glory, and Blink. I remember all them being on TRL, which was a huge show. They were on big like teen movie soundtracks. It was about as mainstream as it gets. Like here's Simple Plan on TRL representing the Dickies, Shants, High Socks, and Web Belt look. And back then, getting on a show like TRL was everything because MTV and those magazines are what drove culture in the way that Instagram does now. So if you put all that together, that is how the like Southern California skate punk inspired look spread all over the world. That's how you ended up with kids in Indiana and Iowa and Scotland wearing Hurley shirts with big dicky shorts. And what's interesting is that for as successful as that stuff was from a marketing perspective, that was kind of the last time that I remember bands having really big clothing sponsors like that. There was definitely some of that that happened in the scene era with brands like Glamour Kills and Rocket and Scale Animals and all that stuff. But as far as I can recall, nothing that involves brands as big as like Hurley and Quicksilver. Maybe a day to remember in Rebel 8, I don't know. This isn't like some corny licensing brand. I didn't license my, my name out or anything. This is me expressing myself through clothing and fashion. And speaking of brands, that brings us to the next trend. Everybody starting a clothing company or shoe brand. There's probably a few more that I'm not remembering, but as far as the big ones, first of all, Atticus. Atticus was founded by Mark and Tom, and according to Wikipedia, a childhood friend of theirs. I'm not sure how big the brand ever actually was. In my head, it seemed like it was really big, but I don't know if it actually was. Surprisingly, I guess it's technically still around. Although, as of now, February 2020, if you go to their website, their SSL certificate is expired, and the website redirects to their Facebook page, so I don't really know what's going on there. If you wear this, it will actually make your penis bigger. And second, Macbeth. 
Macbeth is a shoe company that was co-founded by Tom DeLonge. But what's smart is they didn't just rely on Blink to do their marketing. They actually sponsored a ton of bands. I can't seem to find a list of it because their website doesn't have that. But like I remember they did a Circus Survive collab that was pretty cool. They were also one of the first vegan brands and this was back in, you know, whatever, early 2000s, way, way before veganism was as mainstream as it is now. So they definitely get some credit for being ahead of the curve on that. And I thought this brand was long gone, but actually I'm wrong. It's still around, although looks like their main market has now shifted from America to Southeast Asia, like Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. They have like a whole website and social media presence specifically for the Philippines, which is kind of interesting. Definitely didn't see that one coming, but hey, that is a diffusion of innovation chart in action once again. And just so you know, that's nothing to laugh at. That's a huge market. Philippines and Indonesia alone are probably almost half a billion people. It will make your vagina more amazing. And of course, maybe the biggest of all these famous stars on straps. That's Travis Barker's brand that brought like the Inland Empire desert bro motocross BMX lifted truck kind of lifestyle to the masses. The brand is definitely still going strong. I'm not sure how big it is now, but I know at its peak, it was moving a lot of product. I'm too lazy to look it up, but if you're interested, Travis talks about it quite a bit in his autobiography. I've always been like bizarrely fascinated by that Inland Empire, like desert motocross bro lifestyle. So famous stars and straps, I'm a big fan. I feel like I'm looking into a window into a parallel dimension with like another species that at first looks like humans, but when you get closer, you realize they're not. Anyhow, that brings us to like the second tier of brands started by a band, guys. The first one that comes to mind there would be Made, which was started by the Madden Brothers from Good Charlotte. It is no longer around. In 2011, they changed the name of it from Made to the DCMA Collective and just went like full affliction tap out with it. It's not good. But again, I'm kind of fascinated with it just because of the like desert motocross bro kind of vibe. And I could actually see one of those like weird internet rappers like Lil Aaron bringing this stuff back ironically. I'm challenging you, Aaron, let's do this. And then finally, Role Model, which was a brand started by a couple guys in Simple Plan. I don't really know too much about this brand. It seems like it's been gone for quite a while, but I don't know, if you have any details, let me know in the comments. And aside from just kind of having fun with the random scene trivia aspect of it, there's actually a couple things about this trend that I think are pretty interesting. First of all, this is a great example of like scene entrepreneurship, which if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm a huge fan of that kind of stuff. I love to see people from our culture doing something and starting a company that they control, using their audience to actually create financial freedom for themselves and jobs for their friends. I love that stuff. Uh, just watch the brand grow so much over the past 10 years, starting from an idea that Travis had while we were in the studio writing songs to this amazing company. In hindsight, looking back, it's actually pretty impressive at how big some of these brands became. I would say like, especially Famous Stars and Straps and Macbeth, those are real companies. And that kind of brings up the second point. What happened to this whole thing? What happened to the whole like, band guy starts a clothing company thing? Seems like this was really the peak of that. I know there were a fair amount of metalcore guys that tried to do that, but aside from Ollie and Drop Dead, I can't really think of anybody that did it at the level of Famous Stars and Straps or even like Atticus. But again, I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments if I'm forgetting anything. I would actually love to see this come back for the good of the people in the bands because your time in the spotlight is limited. And if you're smart, you'll take advantage of that and use that platform to build something that can be a sustainable source of income for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Unless you wanna be playing in a band forever, which might sound cool now, but probably won't when you're 40 and have a wife and kids and stuff. But anyway, enough of that adult shit. Let's move on to the next trend on the personal grooming thing. How about those hairstyles? The two most popular ones would be either the faux hawk or that like gelled up spiky hair kind of thing as seen on Derek from Sum 41 or maybe the less extreme version of it on bands like Simple Plan. I actually think that these hairstyles are a really good metaphor for what the 2000s pop punk thing was in general. It was edgy when you put a bunch of gel in it and spiked it up, but it was really just like a normal men's haircut. So you didn't have to commit to having a weird haircut. You could just wash out the gel. And if you needed to go to your aunt's birthday party and look nice, no problem. You didn't have to commit to being punk 24 seven. These boys greet their dad as though they are genuinely glad to see him. And that was kind of the story for this whole era of pop punk, right? Like, yeah, it was edgy, but only a little bit. Not too edgy, maybe PG-13 at worst. Maybe just enough to like make your aunt go, hmm, you boys should really grow up. 
but not like fucked up level of edginess like the bands from the 80s that lived in a van down by the river and were shooting heroin in their neck because all the veins in their arms had collapsed, right? There was no Dwayne Peters in any of these bands. I like girls that wear Abercrombie and Fitch. And so really like by comparison, I think the 2000s pop punk bands kind of had more in common with like NSYNC or Backstreet Boys than they did Black Flag and MDC. I mean like with the spiky hair, they even kind of had the same haircuts. They're really just Backstreet Boys and Dickies with guitars and fart jokes. And honestly, that's kind of why I loved them. I mean, don't get me wrong, of course I love MDC and DI and all that kind of stuff. Always will. But sometimes it just gets so dark and heavy. You're like, dude, it's a beautiful summer day. I really don't feel like listening to a song about being a junkie right now. And the PG-13 vibe of the 2000s pop punk bands, sometimes it's just kind of what you need. It's a breath of fresh air. Can't be like heavy and dark all the time, right? At least I can't. People paid $7 to watch a man defecate into his own hand while he was nude. But anyhow, lastly, my single favorite fashion trend of the whole 2000s pop punk scene, sweatbands on your forearm. Not on your wrist, not on your elbow, on your forearm. Bonus points if it's the red, white, and blue one. And the reason I love this one so much is because why? Why would you want a sweatband on your forearm? Nobody seems to know. I've asked about this on my social media a bunch of times. I've done all the research I can, which admittedly is not much because there's not like a Wikipedia page for history of sweatpants worn on forearm by 2000s pop punk bands. I don't know anything other than it was a thing and I'm kind of obsessed with it. But if you do, please let me know in the comments. I would love to solve the mystery of the forearm sweatband. And you want a giant, giant, giant dick by the Manchester shoe at Zoomies. All right, guys, that does it for this video. Hopefully you had a fun time walking down memory lane and looking at 2000s pop punk fashion trends. Maybe you even learned something from the Rogers adoption of innovation curve and the crossing the chasm thing. Hopefully you did. Either way, let me know what you think in the comments. What was your favorite trend? Do you have any information on the sweatband thing? The people need to know. And also remember the Punk Rock NBA podcast is out now. It's live on every platform. There's a link to that in the description. And I want to thank everyone who supports the show on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to get the podcast going. I was able to hire a producer, an editor, who is the key to making this whole thing work. So thank you very much to everyone who supports on Patreon. I sincerely appreciate you. If you want to support on Patreon, there's a link to that in the description. You get access to a members-only Discord server. I do monthly Q&As. You get all the podcasts a week early. There's a chance to have your band or podcast or YouTube channel reviewed by me or any other thing you want to submit to me. I'll review it all. And one last thing, if you want to talk business, add me on LinkedIn. I'm going hard on LinkedIn, so if you want to talk business, add me on there. There's also a link to that in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.